Lord, uh, we do thank you for uh, the good music and the worship time. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather together to learn about your son, Jesus Christ, today as we keep going through the Gospel of John. Thank you, Lord, for your sovereignty and having brought everyone who's here today. And Lord, you are the one who knows how to apply all that is said um, by your spirit to our hearts. So, you know, our needs are so varied. You know, some of us are doing really well, super happy, joyful. Others may be really suffering right now, hurting, uh, in great pain. And Lord, you know how to take your word and just apply it to our needs. So I pray you would do that. And then uh, go before us now, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, as you know, we are going through the Gospel of John, and uh, this afternoon we are now in John chapter 7, and I've changed the name of my sermon since it was posted. Here's the new, here's the new title. Who on earth is Jesus? Who on earth is Jesus? And uh, you probably remember last week, we did all of chapter 6 basically in one shot. And um, the whole idea there was Jesus claimed to be the bread of life. And um, that caused quite a stir, especially when he said, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And so people were wondering, who is this guy that can claim things like that? And here in chapter 7, this, this whole dialogue sort of goes on. And so that is the question that this text is forcing us to ask today. Here it is. Who exactly is Jesus of Nazareth? Who is he? It's a really important question, right? I mean, at one point in your life, you're here today, you're in a church today, at one point you had to ask yourself that question, who is Jesus and why do you now spend Sundays, or at least part of Sundays, to come and worship Jesus? You had a conclusion over that, over that question. And so that's what we want to look at today. Now, many people have tried to answer this question in various ways over the centuries. And what's true is that nobody can really deny, though some people try, that Jesus was a historical person that had a life that radically changed the course of history and mankind. An historian named Jaroslav Pelikan puts it like this, quote, It is from his birth that most human beings date their calendars, it's by his name that millions curse others. And it's in his name that millions pray. How do we explain this? Jesus of Nazareth has been transforming lives for over two millennia. And in the process, he has rewritten the very direction and nature of human history. It's a fact that Jesus' teaching has been an enormous force of good in the world history. Unfortunately, it's also true that much harm has been done in the name of Jesus, both by the church as a whole and by individuals seeking to use it to further their own agendas. So, who exactly is Jesus? And who exactly does Jesus himself claim to be? Now, clearly, Jesus thought it was fundamentally important that what people thought of him he wasn't interested in neutrality. He often taught his disciples that you're either, either for him or against him. There's no neutral field. Now listen to this. John 14, 6. Okay, Jesus says this. This is what he said. Here he goes. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Now, when Jesus says that, he's not making some abstract meaningless statement. His deity is at the center of his message. He was claiming that there is only one way, one truth, one way to eternal life, and that nobody, no one, can get to the Father except through him. Period. One name, Jesus Christ. Now that is pretty radical. The great Christian apologist C.S. Lewis asked this question about Jesus. Here it is. This is pretty famous. He says, was Jesus Lord, liar, or lunatic? I mean, think about it. A man who declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, cannot simply be considered a great moral teacher. No. No, no. He'd either be considered a lunatic, 
on par with a man who maybe gets up and says, you know what, I'm a poached egg. Well, you'd probably think that guy's crazy. Or he'd be a liar. I mean, he is claiming to be the only way to God, but if he's not, he's a liar. So he's either crazy, or he's a liar, or, this is the better solution, maybe it's true. Therefore, he is Lord. And so ultimately, we all have to make our choice, right? Either this man was and is a son of God, or he's a madman and a liar. You can attempt to silence him for being a lunatic, you can spit on him and kill him for being a liar, or you can fall at his feet and worship him as Lord. But let's not conclude the nonsense about him of being a, just a great human teacher or just a good man. No, he hasn't actually left us that option. His claims don't allow for that. He's claiming to be the only way to God and the only way to be able to, to have our sins forgiven. I mean, in Luke 7, 48, what does he say? He says, my son, your sins are forgiven. Then in Mark 2, 5, when Jesus saw their faith, uh, nope, got that one wrong. No, no, he says right. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So they got it loud and clear. Jesus was not only saying, I can forgive your sins, but in so doing was claiming to be God because only God can forgive sins. So that's the point. Was Jesus God? Could he forgive sins? Or was he an imposter? You can't conclude that he was just a good man. There's just no way. Because if he's a liar, he's not a good man. He's a liar. And if he's a lunatic, well, I guess he could be a good man. But you know what I'm trying to say? It's kind of hard to conclude after all he's saying that he's just a good man. And listen to this. John 5.39 says this, quote, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. So do you know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, if you've got an Old Testament, you know, there's two sections in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. Well, that the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, taken as a whole, have one purpose, to talk about him, him. So either it's true, the Old Testament is pointing to one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, or he's a complete and total egotist. Trying to say, you know what? All this is about me. It's like, are you crazy or what? So either it is or it isn't. Did you know that Jesus even claimed to be around longer than Abraham? And John 8, 53 says, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am, using the name of God. He's saying, I was around before Abraham even was around. Well... That's kind of crazy, unless you are. So, I think you get the gist of what I'm trying to say here. Well, in our text today, John chapter 7, this text shows very clearly the confusion that prevailed even in Jesus' day about who he was. People listened to his teaching and saw him do miracles. They wondered, who exactly is this man? And John chapter 7 majestically describes Jesus' claims, but also the confusion over his identity. Now, verse 12 and verse 43 are sort of like bookends. Verse 12 says, and there was much muttering about him among the people. And then in verse 43, it says, um, so there was a division among the people over him. So people were worried. They, 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 were, they were wondering. They were questioning who this guy was. People grumbled. And what's interesting is that sandwiched between all those verses are multiple views of Jesus that come out. For example, in verse 12, some say he's a good man, and there was much muttering about him among the people, while some said he is a good man. Then in verse 12, others were saying, no, 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 he is leading people astray. In other words, he's a deceiver. So some were saying he's a good guy, others were saying, no, he's a deceiver. 
Third, verse 15, Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it this man has learning when he has never studied? Aha, he's a scholarly teacher, though he never did our schools. Verse 20, this is pretty radical. The crowd answered, you have a demon. Some say, no, 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 this guy's a demon-possessed guy. But others in verse 31, yet many of the people believed him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? So they're concluding he's done miracles. Could he be the Messiah? He's a great miracle worker. Verse 40, other people, other people concluded this. When they heard these words, some of the people said, ah, this really is a prophet. He's a prophet. And in verse 41, others said, this is the Christ, the Messiah. Wow. So, just in those few verses, he's a good man, he's a deceiver, he's a scholarly teacher, he's a demon-possessed man, he's a great miracle worker, he's a prophet, and he's a Messiah. Well, folks, that same kind of confusion still exists today. Nothing's changed. You find the same kind of answers today when you ask people randomly, who do you think Jesus is? Kind of a fun thing to do in Geneva. You'll get everything, absolutely everything. So as we go through this chapter, and we're not going to be able to see it all today, of course, um, how do we outline it? It's kind of a dialogue. It's a long dialogue. Well, today I am seeking help, and this is wonderful about preachers. You know, we don't just kind of do this all by ourselves. We have what we call commentaries. These are other people that have studied these books, so... I got a lot of commentaries, and, um, and there's one that I really like a lot. He's very simple, but very clear. His name is Warren Worsby. Maybe you've heard of him before. And he notes the following. He says, the chapter takes place during the Feast of Booze. It's a Jewish feast. We'll look at this in a minute. And he notes that this entire chapter is divided into three time divisions. Before the feast, during the feast, and after the feast. I like those kind of outlines. Really simple. Before, during, and after. And the responses during each of those periods can be characterized by three words. Disbelief, debate, and division. Disbelief, debate, and division. So that is a really simple outline. Before the feast, disbelief. During the feast, debate. After the feast, division. Thank you, Warren Worsby. It's so good, I'm just stealing his outline outright. I just wanted to give credit where credit is due, okay? So let's start with number one, before the feast, disbelief. Before the feast, disbelief. John chapter 7, verse 1. He says, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. So after this, about six months of ministry spent in Galilee, Jesus... Uh, went about Galilee and not in Judea. That's what it says there. He would not go about Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So he decides to stay in Galilee and not go back down to where Jerusalem was because he knew that his life was in danger. In verse 2, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. This feast, one of the three great Jewish festivals, was the Harvest Festival. And it was during this feast that the Jews temporarily lived in outdoor huts or tents, or little, you know, yeah, huts, I guess you could say, made of wood as a reminder of God's provision when the Jewish people were in the desert. It was a reminder that God lived with his people. Verse 3. So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. Well, now we find out something really interesting in verse 3, that Jesus had brothers. His brother said to him, in fact, they were actually half-brothers and half-sisters. But look at Mark 3, verse 31, says this, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him and said, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And so we know that he had brothers in chapter 6, verse 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? So we find out that the names of Jesus' half-brothers, because the Holy Spirit was his father, not Joseph, were James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us also. So we find out that Jesus had four brothers and also sisters, according to Mark 6, 
3. Now, the Catholic Church rejects the idea that Jesus had brothers since, for them, Mary was a perpetual virgin, which the Bible does not affirm at all. And they teach that these references are, in fact, references to Jesus' cousins. This is unfortunate, as the Bible teaches that Jesus was indeed born of a virgin, but that she went on to have other children with her husband called Joseph. Now, it's interesting, if you back in chapter 7, verse 5, look what it says. He had brothers, but it says that not even his brothers believed in him. Super interesting. So, he had four brothers, sisters. They were all raised with Jesus. They saw him as a little kid. And yet, they did not believe that he was the Messiah when he was 30 years old and had just started his ministry. So, for 30 years... They lived with their, he lived with his brothers and sisters, and they did not believe that he was the Messiah. But later they would. Acts 1 shows us that they're all gathered again, and they're in the upper room praying, and James and Jude would even write New Testament books titled by their respective names, and James would actually become the pastor of the Jerusalem church. So they weren't believers, but eventually did become believers, which is very encouraging. And verse 3 continues, And his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. Since so many of his disciples had left him in John 6, 66, we saw this last time, it said, that is why I told you, uh, verse 66, after this many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And we realize that disciples weren't believers necessarily, they were just people who were following Jesus, part of the entourage of Jesus. They were learners. And um, since so many left him in John 6, 66, why not leave Galilee and go back to Judea, the religious center of Israel, to perform a host of miracles and win back more disciples? I mean, he'd lost disciples. Why doesn't he go back there and get more? And how could his brothers ask him to do this when they didn't believe that Jesus was really the Messiah? Why are they saying, hey, go back to Jerusalem and get more disciples when they didn't believe in him? Why? Two possibilities. Maybe they're thinking political leader, like so many others. Hey, Jesus, this is your opportunity to go back to Jerusalem and maybe become the king, because that's what they were trying to do in the previous chapter. That's possible. Or maybe they just want to see him do more miracles themselves to be convinced, because they're not convinced yet. So verse 4, For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. And if you do these things, show yourself to the world. His brothers think that the very logic of things is that he should demonstrate his glory in public to prove to the world once and for all who he is and convince them themselves. It's interesting. They don't believe, but they said, go and and prove yourself to them. But they're not believing. It's kind of interesting. Because verse 5 says, not even his brothers believed in him. In fact, I don't know if you remember this. Not only did they not believe in him, in Mark 3.21, and when his family heard of this, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. His very parents thought the guy was a lunatic. He was crazy. So that's the point to be made here. Think about this. Closeness to Jesus, listen carefully, is no guarantee of faith. Jesus' brothers and sisters had grown up with him for 30 years, and he was sinless, sinless brother. Can you imagine? It would be hard to live with a sinless brother. Wow. Yet they were unbelievers. So it's quite possible, you know, translating it today, to grow up in a church for your whole life and not be believing. That's why we preach the gospel almost every Sunday from the pulpit so that the Holy Spirit can use the word preach and pierce unbelieving hearts of this congregation. Unfortunately, at some point, I mean, fortunately, this unbelief was transformed into faith, praise the Lord. So we should never get discouraged, ever. If people don't respond to Christ's invitation as quickly as we'd like to. I remember when I was a pastor in Paris many years ago, um, this lady had a lady from our town, older lady, she was in her probably mid-70s at the time, maybe late 70s, had a bridge meeting in some church. 
on Sunday morning, which I didn't quite understand, but anyway, that's the way it was. She went to the wrong church. She showed up at our church, just completely out of the blue. She heard we were preaching on, it was, it was a Easter Sunday, we were preaching on the resurrection of Christ. She was so blown away by what she heard, she went back home. She told her husband, you, you, gotta, you gotta come and listen to, to, to what they were preaching in this church. So she brought her husband back, he was even older, kind of, you know, wobbled in the church, sat in the back. It's a small church, we were like 50, 60 people. And we preached Christ again. So they came up and they said, uh, Mr. Glass, uh, could you please come to our house? We'd like to talk to you. We've never heard this before. And, uh, and so I went over there and by God's incredible grace, both of them came to Christ. And they were both baptized in our little church there. It was incredible. But they were like super old people. So we should never get discouraged if people aren't coming to Christ when we want them to. God has a perfect timing for everyone. In verse 6, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. And he says, Jesus says, Yeah, in in indeed, my timing is different from yours. You can come and go as you please. He's talking to his brothers here. And even go to the Feast of Tabernacles as you please. But for him, Jesus, his time was tied to the Father's timing. And he says in verse 6, My time has not come yet. My time for my public manifestation in Judah, Judea has not yet arrived. Actually, God's timing for him ultimately would be the cross, right? The cross. But all that to say that it's interesting, there's this time thing going on with Jesus and the Father, and, and everything is perfectly planned. He knows when to go and when not to go. Because Jesus is God, he's sovereign, he knows everything, he's omniscient. So he knows. In verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify it about it that its works are evil. Uh, now he's talking to his brother still, and he says this. He says that if they go to the Feast of the Tabernacles, there will be no negative repercussions for them. The world can't hate them because they're non-believers. And the world loves other non-believers, right? Non-believers usually loves, lo like non-believers. But Jesus says in verse 7, if I go to the feast, according to their plan, the repercussions could be disastrous. Why? Because the world hates Jesus, because he's not part of it. Why does the world hate Jesus? Uh -huh. Aha. Why, why, why is it that the world hates Jesus? I mean, you've got to think about this question. I mean, he does do good. He did miracles. He helped people. He fed them. He raised them from the dead. I mean, Christians usually are nice people. They're hard workers. They're courteous. They're nice. They try and forgive people. They are, you know, they're good citizens, good marriages, good families usually. I mean, Christians are, frankly, good people. At least they ought to be, right? Why, why, why would they hate Jesus? Why would people hate Christians and hate Jesus? Ah, good question. John 3 answers that question, verse 19. And this is the judgment. Here it is. The light has come into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. You know what he's saying? He's saying the reason people hate Jesus is not because he's a good man, not because he's a, he's a, he does miracles and does all these cool things. No, because as the light of the world, he exposes the sin of the world. You ask a non-Christian, read the Bible, and ask yourself the question, who is Jesus? They will be uncomfortable with that because that Bible, like the light, will just shine on them and show them you are a sinner and you need to be forgiven of your sins. The judgment of God is on you and you need to turn to Jesus, the light of the world, who can forgive your sin. Well, you know what? People love their sin. So I just read. They love their sin. And it's a threat that Jesus would come and, and, and expose that sin. So either you repent, turn to Christ, or get rid of the light. That's why they hate Jesus. And Christians represent that light too. And that's why 
if you've been hated before as a Christian, or if people don't like you because you're a Christian, it's actually not because you're a, you know, God has changed you to a hard-working, good citizen, but it's because you represent the light of the world and expose their sin. So that's why in verse 8 he says, you can go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast for my time is not yet fully come. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. In verse 9, he stays in Galilee. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. Verse 10, but after this, his brothers had gone up to the feast. Then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So he ends up going. But privately. He didn't want to be captured and be put to death prematurely. So what's the lesson in this short section? Well, first of all, Jesus' timing is not man's timing. And I think it's important for us to remember this, you know, when, when things don't go the way we want them to go, remember, God's timing is different than ours. He has a plan. And we really shouldn't get frustrated. I'm talking to myself. We should worship him. Look, I had plan A, but plan A didn't work out. Now it's plan B. Lord, what's going on? I don't know, but I'm worshiping you. And secondly, being close to Jesus doesn't mean being a believer. You can look like a Christian without being one. That's a little scary, but that was true of his brothers and sisters. So I think that's good for us to think about. So there you have, before the feast, you have disbelief by the brothers of Jesus. Amazing, but true. So this leads to the second section, during the feast debate. During the feast debate. First of all, over his character, look in verse 11. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? There was much muttering about him amongst the people. While some said he is a good man, others said no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. So we already saw this in verse 12. Some people saying, ah, oh, he's a good man. Sure, just fed 20,000 people, made really good wine in John 2. I like the guy, good man. That's true, but it's way more than a good man, right? In John 5, 16, you remember? And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered, my father is working until now and I am working. So we read that, we go, well, what does that mean? He says, Jesus says, my father is working now until I am working. Well, for them, verse 18, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So I'm back to the point at the very beginning of the sermon. People were saying, he's a good man. Jesus answers, no, I'm not, I'm God. It's a little different. I'm God. And his enemies understood what he was claiming. So don't just call me a, a good man. And in verse 12, there was much muttering about him. While some said he was a good man, others said, no, he's leading the people astray. In a way, they were more accurate in their conclusion from their perspective. If Jesus was misleading the multitude and teaching error, that would indeed have made him a false prophet. So do you know what the Bible says one should do to false prophets? Well, Deuteronomy 13 tells us exactly what to do with a false prophet. It's in the Old Testament. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart or with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold him fast, but that prophet or the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way of which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among your midst. 
And Deuteronomy 18 says exactly the same thing. In the Old Testament, a false prophet was killed. So sometimes when I'm talking to people, you know, I've got a lot of friends around here and some people who may have a more of a charismatic, ten, you know, leaning and they believe in prophecy and all that. And they say, John, don't you believe in prophecy? I've got two answers. If you want to hear God talk, read the Bible out loud because this is the word of God, okay? But secondly, I'll say, look, okay, if, 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 if someone wants to prophesy and, and claim to be a prophet, no problem. Can we apply to him what the Bible applies to him? One mistake, he's dead. So go ahead. If you want to prophesy, that's fine. One mistake, dead. That was the criteria in the Old Testament. And uh, usually at that point, the kind of conversation just changes. So I think it's a really important point here because people are saying, he was a prophet? Well, Jesus was a prophet. Never made any mistakes. And Old Testament prophets never made any mistakes. So why would the criteria be lesser for those who want to claim to be prophets today? I don't believe prophets who predict the future still exist today, biblically speaking. But anyway, this is what they were concluding about Jesus. So we're back now in John chapter 7, verse 13. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly to him. So it's interesting, everyone was talking about Jesus. Everyone at the same time was afraid of the Jews. They felt muzzled in their desire to discuss him freely. Why were they afraid? Why were they afraid of the Jews? Well, for the same reason that the parents of the blind man in John 9, 22 were afraid to speak positively about Jesus. They were feared exclusion from the synagogue. That's what happened in those days. I mean, if, if, if they realize that you are talking about Jesus in John 9, 22, well, let me just read it. 9.22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Out of the synagogue. So people were scared. You know, talking about Jesus and talking about him positively now was a very dangerous thing to do in Israel. As we saw, they wanted to kill him. And if you are pro-Jesus, watch out, you're next. That's the way it was. So that was debate over his character. And now, debate over his teaching in verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. So now he's in Jerusalem. And finally, he goes to the temple and begins to teach. Verse 15, the Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is this man, how, how is that this man has learning when he has never studied? They're going, wow. This guy teaches so well, but he never went to the rabbinic schools. He never went to the right schools. He doesn't have the right diplomas. But he's clear and he's accurate. How can this be? Verse 16, Jesus answered, And my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. He's saying, you know what? I'm not teaching. It's not just me. Non-rabbinical. This is God's teaching. My teaching comes directly from God. Verse 16. Now take note of verse 17. This, this is the key. I've been quoting this all week. It's just an amazing verse. Listen to this. Jesus says, If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking of my own authority. It's an extraordinary verse. Here's what Jesus is saying. If you want to know if what Jesus teaches is true or not, Okay, if you want to figure that out, just do what he says. Start doing God's will, and if you do that, you will know whether his teaching is from God or not. Super interesting. That means that believing is not merely intellectual believing the truth, but it's also a desire to putting it into practice. Repenting and saying, whoa, I'm in sin. I, I want to move away from that sin to the Lord and the Lord forgives me. And he's basically saying, start doing what is right and he will re reveal himself to you. See, believing in Jesus is one thing, but entrusting and surrendering your life to him so that he might become your Lord and your Savior is quite another. You know, 
Actually, I'll, I'll be real honest, this is exactly how I came to Christ. In Romans 10, 9, and 10, it says this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So I remember when I was in 1976, I was in India, New Delhi, on, on the street there, kind of bumming around like a, like a hippie. I mean, that's exactly what I was. And uh, I bumped into this Dutch guy a missionary on the street in New Delhi who opened the Bible to John 3.16. He said, John, you're headed straight to hell. You need to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Right there, November 2nd, 19, 1976. And I'd just been to Israel. I'd been in the tomb of Jesus. I was, thinking, I was just trying to figure out who, who, who Jesus was. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm a pretty logical guy. I thought to myself, okay, if, if this is thoughts, nothing will happen. But if it's true, if Jesus can actually forgive me my sins and give me eternal life, just like the Bible was saying, and if I confess him with my mouth as Lord, if he becomes my Lord and Savior, I mean, if that is really true, he's going to forgive my sins, make me become my Lord and Savior, my life will completely change. It's only logical. If the God of the universe invades my little heart, something is going to happen. So I remember thinking to myself, you know, I, I, this is all new. I mean, I didn't know. You know I, I really didn't know, but I knew I was a sinner. And I remember thinking, what do I have to lose? One thing, my sin. Because he came to forgive my sin. So I thought, ooh, am I willing... <sighs> Am I willing to give up my sin? For Jesus Christ. Well, you know what? I was tired of my sin. I really was. And I thought, maybe I should just do what the Bible says and see what happens. Just John 7, 17. Just do what's right. Just do it and see what happens. So right there on the sidewalk. It's exactly what I did. I said, okay, Lord... My feelings are all over the place. I don't know. I know I'm a sinner. I know the Bible says you love me, John 3, 16. I know the Bible says that I need to repent of my sin. I know the Bible says I need to confess him as Lord and Savior. So I did with my mouth. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, if you can do this, if you can forgive me, if you can give me eternal life, do it now. And I thought, oh man, maybe a voice of heaven's gonna, you know, or maybe there'll be a cloud and lightning. Nothing happened. Except I knew at that instant, I just knew. I knew that the God of the universe had just entered my little heart and that his son Jesus Christ had just forgiven me my sins. And the proof was that about 20 minutes later, I went back to my hotel room, never saw the guy again, didn't know who he was. I had two bags of hashish in my pockets, and I looked at all my friends getting high, and I thought, that is like so stupid. You know, 1 Corinthians 2 says we have the mind of Christ, and I thought, wow, God had just already spoken to me, you know, from, from his spirit in a way. I mean, spoken, I don't like that term, but he had, he had tugged at my heart and made me realize, whoa, this is not of him. And I gave away the drugs. I've never touched that stuff ever since. And my life began to change and change and change. Man, I've been a pastor for 39 years. Something happened that day, folks. I'm telling you, something really happened. And I think this is what John 7, 17 is all about. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. That was me. I decided to do God's will, and I found out, whoa, this is really from God. So that's my question to you. Where are you with the Lord? Do you know Christ personally? I mean, do, do, you, do you know this is true? Who do you conclude Jesus is? Just a good teacher? A kook? A crazy guy? Lord. Lord, or a liar. That, that's actually your, your decision. 
And that's why we're going through the Gospel of John, because the Gospel of John is the Gospel of belief. He wants us to understand who Jesus is so that we might believe in him. You're going, yeah, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, fair. I wasn't 100% sure either. Then maybe verse 17 is for you. If anyone's will is to do God's will, are you willing? Just throw yourself to the Lord. He will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. That's my prayer for each one of us, that we would be so convinced, zeroed out, and in our lives to prove it just by the change in our lives. So if there's a doubt, let's just take a minute, silence, just let this sink into you, and if you need to do something with the Lord, just do it like right now, right there in your heart, okay? Let's just take a minute of silence. Lord, we thank you, love you, and worship you. And I pray that you would reveal yourself to each and every person here in a new and fresh way today, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.